You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 443. Lack of money always means a surplus of creativity in the best case. Joe Carnahan. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films, from predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them. The odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. The old distribution model of making money with your film is broken and there needs to be a change. The future of independent filmmaking is the entrepreneurial filmmaker or the film entrepreneur. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. If you're making a feature film, series, or any other kind of video content, the Film Entrepreneur Method will set you up for success. The book is available in paperback, ebook, and of course, audiobook. If you want to order it, just head over to www.filmbizbook.com. That's film, B-I-Z, book.com. And today's show is also sponsored by the Heart Chart Screenwriting Masterclass taught by legendary screenwriter James V. Hart, the writer of Bram Stoker's Dracula, Hook, and Contact, to name a few. His unique story mapping system will teach you how to get your script ready for production and the marketplace. To gain instant access, head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash heart chart. That's H-A-R-T chart. Now, guys, you are in for a major treat today. We have on the show writer-director Joe Carnahan. Now, Joe bursted onto the scene in 1998 at the Sundance Film Festival where his debut $7,000 feature film Blood, Guts, Bullets, and Octane blew the audiences out of their seats. If you're familiar with Joe's other works, you will understand that his kinetic form of directing, which is so unique to him, has been there since the very beginning with his first $7,000 short film. He followed that up with the film Narc, starring Ray Liotta, and then blew everybody out of the water with Smoking Aces, which was such a big hit for Universal that they greenlit a feature for it right away. And he followed those up with films like The A-Team, The Gray, Stretch, and his most recent Boss Level with Frank Grillo and Mel Gibson. And if that wasn't enough, he's not only written everything he's directed, but he also does a couple of screenplays on the side, like Pride and Glory, Death Wish, and the most recent Bad Boys for Life, which grossed almost half a billion dollars worldwide. Now, Joe and I had an absolute ball talking shop in this episode. Our conversation ranges from what the realities of this business is, his journeys with Tom Cruise and walking off of Mission Impossible 3, how that affected him, his career, what he's done in his career, meeting some unscrupulous people along the way. I know that's surprising to hear in Hollywood and so, so much more. So I want you to sit back, relax, and get ready to go on a ride with Joe Carnahan. I'd like to welcome to the show, Joe Carnahan, man. How you doing, Joe? I'm good, Alex. How you doing? I'm good, brother. I'm good, man. Thank you so much for doing this, man. I've I've been a fan of yours, man, for for a while, bro. Since since uh, time, since, I've been in the business seventy four years. So you know, you got a lot of. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so when you worked with Orson, how was that? Yeah. Well, you know, this is back. You know, Joe Cotton and I were close, and uh, I mean, dude, 
<laughs> Jesus. Um, so, so I, I mean, it you, only feels, I only feel like I've been in business that long, dude, you know? Uh, no, dude, I, I, I feel you 110%. As we were talking about earlier, we feel a lot of things more as we get older. Oh, funny. <laughs> By the way, if you could stand the treachery in this town, it ages you anyway. It's like being president, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right? It Bush goes gray. Obama goes gray. Trump somehow just goes more orange. It wasn't gray. It was a weird, you know. <laughs> it's a weird, it was yeah. a weird thing. It was a weird thing. I know. You spent uh, so much time as lucky. We're not, you know, broken down, decrepit. So um, I, I want to start you off, man. I want to ask you, um, why did you be, why did you want to become a director? What kind of got you started in, in what, what made you think of jumping into this ridiculous business? You know what, dude? I just wasn't suited, I think, to do anything else. I mean, I don't think I was smart enough to be a stockbroker or, or school teacher or good looking enough to be a movie star or a rock star. So it's like, you know, you just start going, OK, what can I do? And I and I I had a love of writing at a very young age. My mom gave me this very kind of, I think, very potent love of books. And, and I just took that up. And and uh, and so I was, you know, 13, 14. I was, you know, I was writing a lot. I was writing short stories. And, you know, this is like kind of, I shouldn't say pre-computer because we were always playing like either Atari or in television or whatever. But we really, my mom made a really concerted effort to kind of push us into that. So, you know, and I'd always love films. And and uh, and so I started, you know, when I was 18, I wrote my first screenplay and it was garbage. Um, but I had written a letter at the time. I think Shane Black had written Lethal Weapon. And I wrote him a letter of, as a kind of inspiring on a, on a dude on a long shot of a moonshot chance he would ever respond. And he did. He actually wrote me back because I was doing the, the I was doing the tacky. Hey, I'm going to let me get a hold of your agent at uh, UTA or whatever the hell it was. And uh, let me. Uh, and, he, and he was, you know, he was kind enough to basically say, hey, listen, send your script. You know, time permits, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll certainly read it. And uh, it, dude, it was just dog shit. It was a cool idea, but it was a dog shit script. Um, uh, and, and then, you know, and I just kept going. I just thought like, this is a war of attrition. And, and right. I wrote another one and another one and another one and another one. And I try to tell these kind of fledgling screenwriters, if you think you're going to knock out of the park on the first one or the second one, you're not, it almost never happens. You know, right. um, you've got to teach yourself the craft like anything else. You know, you want to be a great sprinter, you get in the blocks and you sprint every day over and over and over again. And I thought to me, because I never thought I was that particularly good uh, I thought you make up in the margins with hustle and that's so, and I still think that way, dude, I still go about mm. it in the same way I've always gone about it, which is if you want something done, you got to do it yourself. Cause ultimately you're the only one that's going to care that much. So, and, and dude, listen, I consider myself fortunate to still be doing it, to be honest with you, brother. It's like, it's, it's a, it is a brutal, ugly mm. times, merciless. And it's also the greatest job in the world. Right. So, you know, this dude, it's like, you know, when it, it, it it's rewards, it's dynamite, you know? Oh, uh, and it's it, the highs it, and the lows, man. Isn't it the highs and the, the highs are the highest of the highs and the lows yeah. are just brutal. brutal. Oh, brutal. Um, and I've experienced all those things in, in, in great quantity. So, you know, I just kept going, man. And I, I got a job. I got <laughs> I got fired. I got fired from this place because I had to kind of piece me on my my college education together. So I didn't get my bachelor's. So I was almost 25 years old. So. I remember I, I was working at this place and I wouldn't help this guy shoot like basically softcore porn in the warehouse that he had at night. He had a video production services place and he wanted to use these strippers from this local strip club and shoot softcore porn. I thought my name's I can't I can't do that, man. Nothing against uh, hey, nothing against pornography. I'm a giant fan of longstanding, but I'm talking about I was like, no. And I thought he was kind of sleazy. And so he fired me on a Friday. And, and to, so I wouldn't roll over to the next pay period. Of course. That's what a stand up guy, this is he was. And, uh, and I went home panicked. My, my, my then wife was pregnant with our daughter, who's now 25 years old. I was absolutely freaked out. And I remember this local TV station used to do their own 30 second trailers for movies. So I remember I wrote one for Road Warrior, Aliens, and Poltergeist. I wrote three little, little 30 second spots. I purely doing on a lark because I was like, I didn't know what, what the hell else to do. I wasn't fit to do. I wasn't going to go, oh, let me go get a teaching job or a TA's job or something. So I took them. I said, I didn't even know what the hell it was called. I just called, so who does the, the, you know, I called the station. Oh, that's our promotions department. And the guy's name was Andy Crittenden. And I took him down on Friday. I dropped them off. I drove back to my place, my little shitty one bedroom place in Sacramento. I'm sitting there going, you know, what the hell am I going to do? Around seven o'clock, the phone rings and it's Andy Crittenden. And he says, I read your stuff. Why don't you come down Monday? I have a, I have a, a, a promotions producer spot that's just come available. You could take the test for the job. And there I met my dear friend, Kevin Hale, who right now is sitting about a half mile away, cutting cop shop for me and cut boss level. 
So wow. we've been friends that long. We both started a promotions department at this little crummy TV station in, in Sacramento. But it, it was dynamite, brother. It gave me education, every, every form of production. Mm -hmm. um, and it was invaluable in that way. So that's really where I got where the jump was. Um, yeah, and it, I made blood guts. Uh, yeah, we're, we're gonna we're gonna get we're gonna get into blood guts in a second. I also uh, worked in promos back in the day as an editor, doing but not nearly yeah. as yeah not nearly as cool as your stuff, like Road Warrior and stuff. I was doing Matlock and uh, like promos for Matlock and. Oh. And like, uh, what like was it? The, like seven to like seven on eight TV. Yeah, yeah. Right. Andy, Andy Griffith, Andy Griffith show stuff. Like that's what I did back in the day. Oh yeah, dude. Yeah. So yeah, you know, if we they, do, they were brutal. Yeah, you got and yeah. I and I hundreds, 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 hundreds of them. Now I need to ask you, man. Oh, bro. Yeah. I need to ask you. So yeah. can you tell me the story behind your script, Karate Writer? Oh God, did you do it? Okay. <laughs> so there's. So there's a guy I shouldn't be cruel. I don't want to be cruel. His name's Ron Marchini. He's basically like if there was a poor man's poor man's Chuck Norris, he's that poor man's Chuck Norris, right? So he's like he's like you know it's terrible to say, but it was these really cheesy um, you know karate movies, and I had written this kind of what I thought was just really cool. I called it like Stray Trigger, some jerk off title like in the you know early nineties that you did. And and it was this it was this love triangle between this criminal, this kind of hardened killer, killer, a cop, and a psych psychologist. They all kind of were interrelated. And I thought, oh, this will be cool. And I wound up selling it to him for like three thousand dollars, two thousand dollars. This script, whatever the hell it was, which to me was a lot of dough, right? Sure. Um, and and then I got very kind of you know uptight about what they were going to do with it. Long and distinguished career being a fucking pain in the ass. And not not being able to just say, hey, yeah, dude, you know, which we'll get to, bro, where I finally said, yeah, I'm just going to take the money, guys. Knock yourselves out. But um, it was – I don't believe they ever shot it. They did a – I think they called it Omega Cop. I think it's I just, actually I, on you – know, the whole movie's on YouTube. So you can watch the whole movie on are YouTube. You shitting? It's called Karate Raider, but it, – it's called Karate Raider, but within the um, – the description is your movie, but – but the um, but the title in in the movie is different than Karate Raider. So I actually scanned through it. I didn't I didn't sit and watch the entire thing because of it was genius. No, for, I would for, recommend that. It was it was <laughs> it was actually it's actually on some show. It literally just got put up like four days ago. Like, what are the chances? Are you kidding me? I just looked. I was oh, like, well, this hey, lucky me, right, bro? Wow, <laughs> how great is that? Oh, so I Jesus. so I was oh, I was scanning through it. I'm like. Well, man, we all got to start somewhere. We all got that. We all got that project. <laughs> yeah, I mean, dude, it feels like one of those. It feels like one of those horrible relationships you have. Where you're like, yeah, she was gay. He was kind of nuts, and uh, I don't like to talk about it. That's really what it was. But yeah, she tried to uh, try stab me in the shower. It didn't really work out. <laughs> but she's right? but a heart of gold. But a heart of gold. But a heart of gold. Heart of gold. Heart of gay. All right, hey, hey, sweet girl, sweet girl. Don't get me wrong, sweet gal, sweet gal. <laughs> sweet, sweet. Yeah, girl. right. So, Until she came through the, 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 the vinyl with that machete, everything else was, you know, it was great, man. It was, was great. Good time. She was going to be the one. She was going to be the one. <laughs> she was the one. And, and, you know, I'm sure she'll find something nice. To be sure. She'll work out. She'll work no, I, wanted to, I wanted to bring that up because I, like, I always like going deep back into, into, uh, into filmmakers and cinematographers and, and screenwriters' right. uh, early, early work because that's, what, that's, that's where the meat of those stories are. Because, you know, we could talk about all of the successes, but we, and we will, but I always like – I want filmmakers listening to understand that everybody starts somewhere. Everyone's got to eat some yeah. crow. Everyone's going to get punched in the face totally. all, all totally. the time. So that's why that's why I bring and, it and up. Also, do you think? No, you, you listen. These are, uh, you know, these are the necessary kind of doldrums and and uh, and kind of the, the you know the B tier, C tier, D tier, Z tier things you have to do to get going and get your name out there and try to try to make a living at this. It's not easy. Not easy. And again. You know, dude, you and I came of age again where you got, you know, you think about you being in this business, being a poster for 20 years, you've seen technology. I mean, this oh, goddamn phone oh. does more, this in iTunes does more than I ever, that I ever had access to at a full-blown oh. production facility uh, with a DVE and every other thing, you know, with a, with a flame and all these things. Thought, oh my God, this is so amazing. You know, your phone will do that stuff with filters and like, it's crazy. So I always tell people, there's no excuse 
for you to not make something. You know, I, you see extraordinary things made by the amateur filmmakers. It's like, but again, I think the cream will still rise to the top. You know, yeah, no question. And and yeah, dude, you need you need wherever, wherever the hell you're starting out, YouTube, TikTok. Uh, Instagram, whatever you're doing. I got friends of mine that make these fantastic Instagram shows, you know, it's like, but they're still out there trying to grind it out to get the quote unquote um, shot. And, and, uh, and they don't come easy. And again, a lot of times you just got to be willing to get, you know, your balls beaten like a birthday pinata. Uh, and, and, you know, what a great, li- what a great line. Yeah. And, uh, and that, and that is what it comes down to is, is your, you're, you know, how resilient are you? Mm-hmm. How tough are you? And how much do you want to take getting smashed in the face time and time and time again? Because that's really what it's going to require and not take the shit personally. And it's only now, dude, that I, that, I, that I don't I no longer take it personally and I'm no longer I'm inured to kind of the treachery. You're not going to show me anything new in terms of, of, of taking, a you know, you know, six inches of a nine inch steel tempered blade between my spinal column. I, I get it. I mean, I'm, you're, it's like, okay, well, I didn't, you know, there was money or something on the table and you decided to go that way. So, okay. I'm not shocked. It, it's, um, it's, you can't get angry about it. Right. And it's, it's the, the thing I always say is shrapnel. Like you've got shrapnel. I've got shrapnel. Like, you shrapnel, know, oh, it, it could be different shrapnel and that's, and I promise you it is different shrapnel, but I love, it's, I love that. dude. You're right. That but it's great. You got shrapnel. You got shrapnel. And, and that's why, like, you know, you were talking to me early on that you want, you want, you saw that video that I did that that episode i did about you know the truth about independent filmmaking and 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 all and how why they don't make money and things like that and it's just just this raw kind of it's like a shrapnel is the best word i can use because it's 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 a great analogy it's a war and you're going to get hit. And that's why what I what everything I do is because I want to help filmmakers avoid, not avoid, but understand that the punch is coming and how to, exactly. you're going to get hit. You're going to get hit. Brother, you, you can't do them a greater, that's the greatest service you can do to filmmakers. Like if you think that you're going to run that gauntlet and not <laughs> get knocked on your ass and get that kind of ammonia taste in the back of your throat and you really get the shit kicked. You know, you're going to, you're going to taste if you are, man, that bitter coppery it's coming. And I think too many people make this false arrangement slash agreement with themselves that, Oh, it's, Oh yeah, but not me. I'm going to call coast. And I've certainly seen it. And then I've seen those same people dude get dropped from the stratosphere and, and land on their head. And it's like, it's just gonna, you're not gonna, be able to sit it out. I don't care how good, I don't care what cloud you think you're cruising on, you're gonna get knocked. It's, and, and by the way, you should want that. And you should want it, and, and, and it doesn't matter, dude, it happens all the time. It's happened to me, it's happened to me multiple times. And right. it's again, how you shake it off and keep going. And the great thing is, brothers, you know, you, it's like, you've been doing this as long as you've been doing it, I've been doing it, it's like, you don't, we don't age like athletes. You know, we're not a blown <laughs> rotator cuff away from like, that's it, you get better. Mm-hmm. I'm better now. My I'm better in my fifties than I was ever was in my thirties or forties. As if ever and it, across the board better. So anybody that doesn't, you know, Raymond Carver didn't publish his first short story. He was fifty two years old. So it's like you can be one of the most prolific kind of American short story writers. It's like there is always room to, and it's and it's age proof. It shouldn't mean oh, I got to be this young upstart kid. It's like I don't. Those experiences don't necessarily move me <laughs> the way the experiences of people that have lived life do. So, so yeah, man, it's always, it's, it's never too late and you can always improve. And I love that about the craft, you know? Absolutely, man. Now you, you had a, a, your first feature um, was called bullets, guts, blood, and octane, which arguably, which was arguably the, one of the best titles uh, that come out of the nineties, I have to say. Uh. (laughs) Well, I hope so. (laughs) Maybe not the best film to come on tonight. So no, but no, no. again, brother, going back to this, this is a this is a movie that I was in. We made for like seven grand. Mm-hmm. It was it was designed to totally to kickstart everything. I think unfortunately we, we got caught in the massive uh, like wake that Tarantino had created, and no one could do a crime genre film of any kind without the immediate supposition being, well, it's Tarantino, it's Tarantino, as though that genre never existed prior to Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction. So that always kind of rankled me because. There's used cars, Bob Zemeckis in there. There's Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. There's all these kind of influence. Elmore Leonard. There's all that shit. But watching it now as a much older guy, I think the writing is great and it's funny and it's goofy and it's amateur, but it works. And it's like it just never. I never. Um, I never thought it got a fair shake. I'm shake. And I think. I think. I think. I've had one of those careers, dude. I think it's always been. Um, 
and you know, you sit here and go, well, I never got my due. I never got my due. It's not about getting your due. I just always think I was misunderstood in certain ways. And it took movies like The Grey to go, oh, the guy, I guess the guy is serious about, oh, you know, it's like, uh, it's, it's like but I just don't like to do the same shit. You know what right. I mean? And it's like, and I think sometimes that, because it's not, I'm not, I've always said this, I, I'm not, I don't want to make, I'm not interested in making movies. That, I'm not, I don't give a shit if they say anything about me in 50 years. You know, it's like, I want to make stuff I enjoy and stuff that, you know, that, that for whatever, the, whatever it is, but I'm certainly not curating a career. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like, I, I think about it very much, you know, I came from, you know, a, a lower middle class, you know, middle Michigan kind of, and, and you're lucky to be, Hey, you pulling a paycheck doing this. I mean, my mother says to me, well, honey, I'm, at least, you know, at least I'm glad you got your, got your degree. It's like, mom, I think I'm okay. I think I'm all right now. You, uh, you make this film and, and from what I understand, yeah. you shot it on 16 and edited it on video. Yeah. So I'm assuming you edited it on three quarter or did you do? No, uh, bro, I, I, I did an M2, the Panasonic M2, which was the cheap. Wow. Oh, I know, dude. The horror. I know, bro. I know, bro. You look like you just saw like a like like oh, you know like a no, photo. No, because oh, I, I I actually and I actually saw I actually did some research and it is it true that you edited on the Pinnacle DVE? No, brother. I edited on it was yeah the fast yeah, the other the, the Pinnacle the fast it was the precursor to the Avid. But I'll tell you this, dude. To me, to this day, that interface is still better than Avid's. It just is because <laughs> you could drag and drop. You could do all this you, which you can on Avid. But to me, and again, I, I, I I'm. I mean, dude, I'm cutting right now with Kevin. I've cut, I've cut in every one of my films. I've cut sequences or scenes, or I've done sure. because I, I, st I cut my, I cut this movie, Blood and Guts. I cut it all myself. So, you know, I still understand. I love editing. To me, is like writing, right? It's very, it has that same kind of effect. But you know, you, it, it's never that was so. The ease of use on that was so great, and so. But it was, I don't even know if they're still in business, dude. It's like no, if they're I, still making. I think they are. Like when I five to one compression rates, and 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 it's oh. like. It, 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 dude, it was just – and all – brother, listen. When you just think this is good, the way people are going to see the movie, you're not, not – oh, fuck. Black, make it black and white. I don't care. Oh, who gives a shit? You know? but, and, and again, dude, the theory being creatively that shit ceases to be shit if it's moving fast enough. They're not going to realize they made it for no money. The, the performances are – you know, a bunch of kids, blah, blah, blah. So it was – you just had this kind of devil-may-care attitude about the, the editorial thing. And then they go, oh, now back to film. Oh my God. So I had to go, everything had to go back to be transferred. And then I had to have an IP. Then I have an, you know, an IN. Then we had the negative cutter. And then we had, oh my God, check. It was like, oh my God. And this is back, dude, photochemically. You had to, this is how you had to color films. You didn't have the Da Vinci. You didn't have like, you couldn't go into like, like, what's your luck? What the fuck? You know, it's like, there's too much cyan in this one. There's too much magenta. And, you know, you do, but you did it. You went and screened reels. So it was a totally foreign, but, but yet I'm, I'm, dude, I'm glad because I got the tail end of that. And it was yeah. great education that I wouldn't have had. Like over the last week, you know, with films we were still cutting on a camera. It's like, oh, okay. You know, but that's gone, bro. That's like, no, that's, that's, uh, but I'm glad I experienced. It. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, but it, yeah. And the other thing I heard from you is about that. The story about, um, blood and guts was that you, you actually, used all the t the TV station you were working at all their gear and all of their lights and anything well, you can grab a house without without their kind of permission or they were they, they well, frowned they, upon they, they, it? it the guy I mentioned earlier Andy Crittenden gave me permission then he took a job at Fox and then it was one of those well I asked for forgiveness and permission now because I'm not going to go back to the GM of the station and then literally that Saturday as we're shooting the GM of the station walks into the conference room where we all are are sequestered shooting this scene and basically said well I hope somebody's making money on this but he never shut me down Eli Trashinsky who's a really lovely guy and years later dude years later I'd done smoking aces and never I was at a, this really kind of nice Mexican restaurant in Sacramento and uh, my kids were still up there and I saw him and his family having dinner and I bought him all dinner. He had no idea what the hell was going on. And he came over. He was like, and he was so lovely. You know, but I'm like, like, hey, dude, that was a brilliant thing you did for me. And you never, you never like shut it down. You never kind of, you could have, and you didn't. So I was, I was, you know, I was, I was, you know, dancing between raindrops, dude, um, <laughs> uh, on that particular thing. But yeah, dude, it was all brother M2 machines, mm -hmm. digitized would tell my then wife on a Friday, I'll see you Monday morning and I would, or Monday night. And I would work through and bring a change of clothes. I slept under the, under the editing console, um, on one inch stacked reels. I, that's how I'd sleep and just cut dude, just, just to get this goddamn thing done. Cause I thought if not now, when, <laughs> and if not now, never, you know what I mean? It's like, it was one of those deals. And so, then yeah, you, got, dude, and then very, you, 
So you do this film for eight, seven, eight thousand dollars, right? Then you get into Sundance in the midnight screening, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so you yep. get into Sundance, and I and I see the trailer, which is so brilliant. That trailer that you sh- that you edited for like for Blood Guts is like how did a sun- how did an eight thousand dollar movie get into Sundance and, right. b- b- and you just right. boom boom boom. And I was like, man, we did this all is- our marketing, dude. We did it was all great kind of guerrilla marketing. Yeah. And by the way, dude, you know, like. Like my buddy, like Kevin Hale, like looked like he's smuggling heroin through the airport and was selling kids to the gypsy. I mean, it's crazy, dude. We went way over the top in these little like kind of vignettes. But it was like those kind of that vibe was what we needed to have happen. And it was because we were just lucky to get anything, dude. It was like, you mm-hmm. know, bro, that idea that it was to play theatrically was nuts, nuts. So that in and of itself was just a gigantic victory for us. And everything else after that was great. I didn't I thought the first screening at the library at Sundance was kind of a disaster. It was fine. But I thought the second screening, um, which was in God, where was that little area where like it was in the, it was the holiday it was the Holiday Village Cinema, I think. Mm-hmm. That one was a bunch of snowboarders and they loved the movie. It was a very different crowd. It wasn't the kind of the it wasn't the, the it wasn't the film crowd. It wasn't the Sinise. It was kind of like the guys just coming off the slopes of the snowboard. They loved it. And so, but it was, dude, it was the Sundance experience. It was like yeah. that was every at that time, brother. And I don't know if it's the same now because Sundance is a very different place. That was the that was the goal, man. That was the Sundance Film Festival was was that was it. You know, you got there and you were on your way. Um, that, that's I think that was the first time my mother saw Robert Redford in a restaurant. She's like, oh, I think maybe you know you could make something of this, honey. It's like, yeah, uh, <laughs> I think you know we'll see. You know, it's like that's the. That's the goal, mom. That's the goal. I don't move furniture the rest of my life. So yeah. And the funny, and funny thing is, like, my dad still doesn't know what the hell, the hell I do. Like, I took him on set one day on a on a spot. Yeah. yeah, they're like, "Do you make money? You're obviously doing it well enough to to, yeah. to own a home in Los Angeles. So whatever you're doing, keep and doing you it. Have a family. You have a few girls you're taking care of, and yes, <laughs> right, right. You don't but they, seem to be engaging in high end bank robbery, and right. So yeah, dude, whatever you're doing, so, so, keep doing it, kid. Yeah, because yeah. that generation, but, like but that generation, is goes, like hey, the less I know, the better. <laughs> like it's, it's so fu- it's so funny because ge- that generation's all about like if you don't work in a factory, if you don't like bust your ass for nine dude, to five, it's not a job. Oh, dude, it, it's not a job. Like, what are you doing? You know, like what, no, no, writing. I don't understand it. Writing. What? Wait, what? What? Writing. <laughs> write what? Yeah. I write. I don't get paid to write. <laughs> Grillo's got this great. He, he's got this great. Uh, uh, um, Grillo's got this great story about his, he and his dad stand on like the like the patio of his place in the Palisades, and he just he, his dad's like he's like, you got this from acting. <laughs> he's this big, he's got this beautiful kind of sprawling pad in uh, in uh, uh, in. Uh, because uh, there's foul states, and it's like, and it's like, is dad from acting? You got this? No, no, I've been knocking off 7 Elevens. Yes, from acting, I got this. It's like, but dude, it's a generational thing, bro. It's a generational it, it, it is, it, it is. And I think the generation coming up behind us, like our, our daughters and, 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 and that, yeah. they, they, they are so aware of everything. Like they, they know about, you know, if being on online and they know about followers and they know about building content and they, they get, they, they, they are so much. They're just exposed to stuff that we weren't exposed to. So they are, it's, they are. It's they in, are. It, and I think that's the thing, dude, is to try for me at least to slow that down because I'm so terrified that that overload is very real. You yeah. Know, it's very real and it's scary and it's and it's kind of um it's it's uh I, I it's pervasive. No, I agree with you. I agree with you hundred percent and I try to do everything I can, but then they see what I do and you know, and and, and they're just like it's exciting. Yeah. They, they just like they Google they they Googled me the other day and they're like, Daddy, right. like people know who you are. I'm like, look, man, I, I am right. nobody. I in the grand scheme of the world, I am nobody. <laughs> but but yeah, there's a few people right, who right, right. We, brother, all, bro. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm not right. you know, yes. like I'm not Obama. Like I can't I can walk right. the street. Like everybody in the world knows who Dude, think <laughs> about this, bro. Think about if you couldn't. That's always I I because I've watched oh. that happen friends of mine listen i watched it happen to chris pine i watched it happen to yeah. bradley cooper i watched it literally happen to them in real time where they couldn't be themselves anymore and yeah. like they had to deal with 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 uh you know with uh, uh you know with uh, being constantly bombarded and constantly inundated with um requests for autographs requests for pictures i remember sitting at dorchester having dinner with Brad- bradley cooper and this woman comes up and says can i get your picture and she says oh honey i'm just i'm right in the middle of he's trying to be cool i'm right in the middle of a meal she goes when are you gonna be done I just kind of posted up there. I'm like, see, I couldn't do. I don't have the time. 
I'll, I'll put the I'm gonna put I'm gonna put this fucking fork in your hand. How about that? And then we'll and then and then you know it's like, are you out of here? Get the fuck away from the table. Have some respect. You know? I know, I, I know, dude. It's 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 insane. But you're right. You, I've seen someone's you know like, come on, man. You know it's just ridiculous. But, it's 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 insane. Yeah, dude. It's, I don't. I would know what to do. I wouldn't. I, I, I you know I get recognized once a blue moon. It flips me out, dude. It flips me out. Yeah, you know? it, uh, it yeah. does. Yeah, when I was talking to Albert. Albert, uh, he was, he was Albert, uh, Albert Hughes. I was talking to him uh, the other day on our show and he was telling me, he's like, dude, I was at Planet Fitness and some dude walked up to me. He's like, Hey man, I got a script. Like he's oh on God, the dude. treadmill and he's oh like, God. and he's like, uh, well, I'm in the middle of working out. He's like, all right. And he waited. He's like, I'll wait till you're done. And he just stood there next to him. Dude, and Albert I, I was like, say, man. Go through your CAA. Yeah, I can't. You know, you got to go through the agency. I can't because if I read one page and somehow I put, you know, yeah, yeah, guy it's... walks into a floor, I ripped your st- I ripped your script off. It's like you know, okay, you know, you can't. But do that. That. it's it's no. insane. It's insane. Dude. And it's I insane. get it, brother. I get the hustle, man. I do. I get it. I get it. I get it. But there's but it's a right way to do it. But there's a right yeah. way to do it. Like, look, man. Yeah. I literally got the word hustle on my my shirt and on my hat. Um, my right. whole brand is about hustle. But I've been I've been yelling and screaming from the top of the mountain. I'm like, look, guys. There's a way to do this and there's a way to yes. approach people and there's a way to, to do that hustle and respect it as opposed to like calling somebody at their house or dropping off a package at their house yeah. or pro- like, there's ways of doing it. And dude, and- it's creeper. I like, I don't want you coming near my, don't, don't do that. It's yeah. like, I don't, that's not for public consumption anyway. I don't want you to know where the fuck I live. So who, you know, come on, man. You it's like enough. any more than you would want me to know where you live. It's like, it's creepy, right? It's like, so and, you, and I get it, dude. Listen, part of me is always it's always it's always cut with this kind of sympathy of all right, I get it, man. You know, it's like, you know, I, it is it's bro, it's trying to get stuff. But but the idea that I'm just going to jump right into your screenplay and change your life. And it's like, and I'll say to you, how many scripts do you read? Except for script, write another one. What are you waiting on? Don't 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 sit around, you know. Uh, the coffee shop waiting for this one to take flight, write another one and, and work. And you got to work them. You know, you got to multitask these things. You got to absolutely of, um, keep them all, you know, keep all of them moving and shaking in a different. You have to, you have, you have to, I still have to, everybody does. And you should, I like that. I like that experience. You know, I'm used to it. You know what I mean? And it, it's comforting to me um, as opposed to just having stuff kind of float in and here you go. Here you go. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. now back to the show you know so so your your next film was uh, a bit of an upgrade from the eight thousand dollars um which was narc um how how yeah. did how because there's a i remember there's just a lot of stuff swirling around narc i remember when narc came out and because it was then right. and during that time we were still like it was on the tail end of the whole sundance kind of craze which was when tarantino and rodriguez and smith and Linkletter yeah. and spike and singleton all these yeah. guys were coming up so you were on the tail end of that like in 98 with octane yeah. and then narc came out so um exploded onto the scene i remember people were like talking about it left and right like oh my god this is right. like a revelation this is the next big thing um and and i will get to that part but man i heard other stories about like the making of it and the money behind it and a lot of craziness is can you go into that a little bit Dude, it was, listen, it was one of those, it was one of, the, and this is the way that a lot of these independent films are financed. They're very, uh, listen, there's, anytime there's, anytime there's millions of dollars, you're going to have people in there that want to siphon off a certain amount of that. And, 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 uh, and uh, it's like the skim in a casino, you know, it just is. And if you say, if you think that you're dealing with, you know, these honorable sorts across the board, you're dead wrong. You know, you're not. You know, you're dealing oftentimes. I mean, one of the guys on there was like literally gone to prison. Uh, uh, he, and he was I think he was he may have been like I, I think at one point he was like trying to reach out for me from like, you know, like the Baker Denver Row cell block, seat, whatever the hell it was. It was like, wait, wait what? This guy's. So it was very <laughs> it was. And I remember, you know, they were they would we'd say to the you know, the, the, it's like, hey, man, we didn't get the wire. And it's like, oh, oh, you know, um, OK, look, we'll send it. We we just got to find the number, and then they and then they and then they call us back and go, oh, we can't remember which bank we made the wire with. And I'm like, guys, you're doing the adult version of my dog ate my homework. This shit isn't isn't funny. You know, we've got a crew we have to pay, and you know, we're in we're in Toronto in like the dead of winter, 
And I remember walking onto a set one day, this kind of really uh, run down little one bedroom apartment. I, and I remember, I, I remember walking and there's the production manager and I turned the corner. I hear him say, I don't know when you're going to get paid again. I don't know if you're ever going to get paid again. And this is 7 a.m., you know, before we shot any, you know, and I just listen, I just decided the, the best way to deal with the situation was just to take the bull by the horns. I said, guys, listen, we're dealing with disreputable people and people that are kind of sleazy. And you have mortgages and you have, you know, car payments, and you have kids to feed. I can't tell you how to do that. If you don't, if the money's not here by the end of the day, you should walk. I would. And I think for whatever that was worth, it galvanized them for a moment. And they kind of, they understood our, our plight and they hung in there. Um, but dude, you know, it was, it was a movie that could have very easily kind of disappeared and just been this cool little, you know, but I remember going to the Eccles theater, which is still the best screening I've ever had of, of a movie. And it just went through the roof. And I remember right after that, they took myself and Ray and Jason Patrick up to the main street of Park City and put us on uh, put us on CNN Live. It was great. Right. And I thought, OK, that was something happened. And um, and then, you know, kind of post that coming back, Lionsgate, Tom Ortenberg, who I'd made three films with, who, I, who picked up Blood Guts. They um, they uh, um, uh, it started this whole there's like, you know, the, the Bel Air screening circuit is basically a euphemism for rich people that have, that have theaters in their homes. And so I started meeting all my heroes, Dustin Hoffman. And I remember like, just, just meeting everybody, all these great, you know, and one night I'm having dinner with Ortenberg and Jason Patrick. We look up and Warren Beatty's standing there. He just came down to like Banderas on Barrington and Wilshire just to hang out and talk about the movie. And, and it was just this crazy. And then, you know, I get the call that, you know, Tom Cruise has seen the film and he wants to meet you. And and I go to Cruise Wagner. I'll never forget it, dude. And I'm in the conference room and I didn't realize the, the, the main entrance had a little latch style lock and it was locked. And suddenly the door just starts trembling, trembling to like shake it. And then just pulls open. The lock flies off and there's Tom Cruise. And 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 we start talking. He goes he was dating Penelope Cruise at the time. And he goes, listen, she had a family member that had she she I knew she walked out of the movie. She covered her eyes and left the film. And he goes, I knew it was as good as I thought as good as I knew it was great. And it was a great movie right there because she couldn't bear it. And and uh, and and then, dude, and you know, listen, he got that film a tremendous amount of uh, attention. notoriety yeah. and attention, and and really rescued it from being. It could have just been this little three million dollar indie that you know was cool and 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 disappeared. And he really made it kind of bigger than the sum of its parts. And and for that, I'll I'll be always be grateful to him uh, for doing that. You know, yeah, and 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 that's not something that Tom does very often. Like he hasn't 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 like um, shepherd a an indie or you know an independent or a very you know much lower budget non studio film like that. I don't remember. He might have no. done a couple here and there, but I don't I don't remember him doing that. It's not what he no. does. Yeah, no, he was really it was something else, man. It was something else to kind of. I don't think I was aware of how of how extraordinary that was. You know. Yeah. Uh, for me to experience and uh and and only now as a much older guy I go you dumbass <laughs> you know it's like you idiot like, you 31 year old jerk off kid didn't really know what the fuck was going on it's like you know by the way please shut up you know what if i could time travel if i had doc brown and a fucking delorean i go back and slap the shit out of myself shut the fuck up not everybody needs to know what's on your mind bro shut up and lose 25 pounds that's what i'd say to myself you know <laughs> Cause I'm, cause I'm feeling it now. You, you, you fat. Yeah, you <laughs> Yeah, everything's your pain in the ass, dude. Nobody likes you. Shut the fuck up. You know. So, uh, so, so, uh, no, it was, but it was, it was remarkable, brother. It was one of those like, just kind of amazing moments in time. And and uh, and, you know, the movie came out. The movie did what it did. It was. I think it was. It was obviously it was. It was successful in in as in so far as it was one of those movies that got. Listen, Paramount put a, put a, put Oscar money behind it and. Mm -hmm. Did a campaign for Ray, did a campaign for the screenplay, did a campaign. You know, it was it was great, dude. It was really something else, you know. So then from from that film, uh Tom hires you to do Mission Impossible Three. Yeah. Which yeah. which <laughs> which in hindsight, and, and I'm I'm just thinking this myself, like if Kevin Fahey knocks on my door tomorrow and says, I want you, Alex, to direct the next Avengers, and here's two hundred million, I would probably I would take the meeting. But yeah. <laughs> Right. You take you okay. take you take the meeting, 
But you're gonna get free coffee. The, 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 right? At least there's that, bro. You're gonna get a free cup of coffee. So you free got- cup of coffee or a bottle of water at least. The bottle, the water least, bottle tour. Right. That's the extraction. Right. But but the point is, you know, I mean, at this age, I think we we can really, like, you know, this. I I I don't want to overextend myself. I haven't. Give, give me a ten million dollar movie. Give me a a fifth. Dude, you jumped. Was, you jumped. Yeah. It was, dude, it was, yeah. It was, and I also think in my hubris, and I think, listen, the script that Danny Gilroy and I wrote, I still think is a knockout, and I think there's elements of it that work their way into those later uh, 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 Mission Impossible films being disavowed, having to go to ground. That was all stuff we covered in, in MI3. So so I think it was, again, dude, my kind of naivete and my inexperience in, uh, in thinking that I could really kind of shepherd this in a way that I retain kind of the, the auteur's uh, uh, vantage, <laughs> which was never fucking going to happen, right? <laughs> and not just put myself into a process that take the ride, kid. It's you're going to make a lot of money, you know. Um, and I think they, I think, listen, this is what you realize too. I think now with these with these big franchises, I think they don't, I don't think they want filmmakers, brother, so much. I don't. I think they want someone that's had kind of a ready uh, hit and kind of an indie darling or whatever, and then they plug them into this kind of gigantic franchise. <laughs> But it is a largely plug and play scenario. It's like, it's like you know, uh, my wife jumps horses. She's an equestrian, and you know they have these million dollars. She calls them push button horses. You put anybody on that horse, and that horse is going to take them through a course, and they're going to look great. But that's not riding. You know what I mean? And kind of, it's a little bit the analogy I would think of now. It's like you're not, not that there's anything wrong with these films. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that process, man, is, is it's 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 preordained and it's predestined. And mm-hmm. and you're gonna you're gonna have to understand that. And I didn't. And and I was a pain in the ass. And and I thought that I was fighting the good fight. And I've always said, told the story. I think, listen, I quit a week before they were gonna probably sack my ass. You know, they were, I was out. And and listen, I do I have regrets about it? I don't, dude, because it was my process and it was my journey. As as stupid as that sounds, and it was something I had to experience on my own. And I had to live and die by that decision. So, you know, I thought my career was over and it was one of those, listen, it's one of those gut check moments in your life. It's like, how good are you? Can you get yourself out of this? Are you going to be able to make another movie? And so, but it was, but I don't, I, 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 I have the greatest stories about that time, you know, these yeah. and anecdotal now, dude, and that's what it's meant to be. And not, I don't have an ounce of rancor. I don't have an ounce back then. I was like, oh, motherfucker, brother. No, listen, man, Tom gave my tiny little movie a gigantic birth, man. He really did and really helped me out a lot and really propelled my career in ways that I'm probably still not uh, 100% cognizant of or, or aware of or, or, or appreciate. So, you know, you got to take that for what it's worth, dude. And and uh, and, and it was, you're right, going for, going for a $3 million movie to a $180 million movie, probably not the most astute career movie. You know what I mean? Like... Yeah, you know. yeah, 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 yeah. You gotta chillax a bit, man, because you because you're. And I gotta, I gotta, I gotta imagine, man, that the town, like you, you, you walking away from such a high profile star and project, where yeah. there's probably a thousand directors in line waiting to do a job like that, and you just like, you know what, I'm out. I'm assuming that that gave a, the, the town gave a bad tip. Like, who is this guy? What is he really about? Like, it must have been a struggle for you to even just get the next thing going again, oh, I'd it imagine. Was. It was, it was, it was, and you know, it's like, I remember a kid talking to, it's a great story. Al Workman was a lawyer, is a lovely guy, and I was trying to get my daughter into Gallatin at the, at the Tisch School at NYU. I was talking to Al, and he goes, Joe, I got to tell you, I got to, I got to, I got to thank you, man. You gave, uh, you gave my client of his feature career. I go, oh, who's your client? He goes, J.J. Abrams. <laughs> <laughs> Glad I could help. No, glad, glad I could help. Wow. Well, I say with great affection, I adore JJ. He's one. He's a man. He's one of the great. One of the great guys in this town. He really is. I've heard. I've um, heard. I've heard. I've heard that from people who work with him. Incredibly underrated, I think, is a but one of the most lovely uh, human beings. He's just. A, he's. A, he's. A, he's a guy. I love him. Um, so I say that. But I just think to myself, Oh, you fucking idiot! You know, you idiot! <laughs> you had. You had to open your mouth, didn't you? You had to say something. You couldn't shut the fuck up. You had to say something. But, but that's but, yeah, but, but that's you though, man. That's that's yeah. that's 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 your brand, if you will, as right. a as as a, as a, an artist. I mean, from from what I've seen from, as a fan, that makes all the sense in the world. Like that you yes, were that I dude. Guess, I guess, bro. I get. Listen, I I don't think I I don't think I've ever. 
I certainly don't take myself that serious. I take the work very serious and I think right. overly serious sometimes. And you have to kind of know, you know, you got to, you got to, you got to, you got to, you know, spare your powder when you can, you know, don't die on every hill. You know, it's like you, and that's, I think I, it, that those are, those are, you know, hard fought lessons and hard learned lessons, but they're lessons nonetheless. So, um, you know, I'm thankful that I've, that I've, uh, and you know, dude, listen, there's guys out there and guys I won't name and kind of, you know, the filmmakers that can plug into those situations and understand those uh, ebbs and flows and, and so on and so forth. And it's like, and, and they have these tremendous, they have these, they make, you know, they make these big studio movies and franchises and sequels and so on and so forth. And I always say like, I want their money. I don't want the career, but I want the money. You know what right, I mean? Right, right. So yeah. Me. Yeah. I, I don't want the career. I think my career is very cool and weird and offbeat and it, and it mirrors I think who I am. Um, uh, and so I like that because I think it has, a, it has its own personality. Um, but, but I'd be lying and say, yeah, shit, man, I'll take your, absolutely. I'll take your money. Uh, but those guys also have the gear, the, the gear changes and the understanding and the nuances and the subtleties of dealing with, you know, the film exec and the, and the studio chief and the thing that I think I possess now, but I certainly didn't at the time. And, and, and again, you know, and there's great, that kind of, that kind of savvy and that business acumen is something that I had to really work for and took a long time to develop. And the, and some of those guys just have it, dude. They just get, they know, bro, they know how to surf those breaks. And, uh, and, and I'm, and I admire that. You know? Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's, it's the, it's the, uh, I was talking to an agent once um, and they said, you know, when I'm looking for in a client, a director client is I need an artist, a businessman and a politician and they have to have all three yep. things. And it, yeah, and dude. Yeah. It's so, so, so true. Um, now from, yeah, you don't, yeah, you don't. And without those things, brother, you, you, you are going to be, you are going to be left lacking. You just are, you are. Now, um, you, you did one of the higher, I love that higher series that, uh, for oh, BMW. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That How was, was that, man? Oh, it was brilliant. It was Tony Scott. Like I got, I got signed at RSA, uh -huh. Ridley and his company. Um, they were so generous and so loving and so uh, welcoming. And it, at the time, it was like Tony Scott, John Woo, and who the fuck is that clown? Because the people that done it prior were Fincher, Frankenheimer, right. um, uh, 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 Blanket. Who did Chunking Express? Um, oh, oh, Guy, Guy Ritchie, Guy Ritchie for the star. Guy Ritchie, right? Um, so there was this great kind of band of of, uh, of notables, and then there was you know me bringing up the rear like hey yeah it's me you know so it was but it was you know I, dude i got clive owen at marie abraham uh um i got to work with Marl fiore for the first time it was one of those like you know it felt like fantasy baseball camp it's like go ahead you put the pinstripes on and you can take batting practice like wow i'm here so it was you know don Cheadle. it's like it was a blast man robert patrick ray liotta i, I got to work with these great wonderful wonderful people um, and, and it was right after Narcs was, again, it was the, and I think I was, that was prior to Mission Impossible. So I'd done that just after in the kind of the, 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 the rush of, uh, of, uh, Narc, um, and, and, and had a commercial career, which I never anticipated ever having, uh, which was great. Dude. It was amazing. It was, it is awesome. Um, now, uh, the, the the thing I've always loved about your filmmaking in general is that it has a very specific energy. There is right. a kinetic energy to your films, some more, some less. So yeah. like um, the gray has a different kind of that energy. Um, right. But then I think the ultimate expression, and please correct me, the ultimate expression of the Carnahan kinetic energy is smoking aces. Like it is this. I think it was until boss level. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I was going to say boss level, yeah. boss level. It's, it looks it looks very it has that thing, but the colors the 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 amazing ridiculous cast you had um right, in right. smoking aces the kinetic energy i was I was remembering like when I saw it in the theater, it was just like I felt abused after I finished watching it like I felt physically assaulted right. by the by the visuals of it. it was visceral and yeah. um it was so visceral it, like with the launch with two at least another two sequels right yeah yeah it, it like just kept universal yeah yeah. It yeah, did so buddy, well. Uh, yeah. Buddy PJ Pesh directed one of them. Yeah. It was, it was one of those, again, dude, it was one of those, I think it was born out of my frustration about Mission Impossible 3 and this idea that I wanted to do something that was just kind of 
almost like it's a mad, mad, mad world, right? This kind of, you know, kind of zany, uh, over the top kind of assault on a penthouse with this kind of, you know, and this, this weird magician kind of illusionist at the center of it. And, and this idea of inner, of these interlocking, interlo- interlapping stories, overlapping stories that, that were just kind of, um, uh, again, my kind of sense of humor and my sense of irony and my sense of the sardonic and all that weird shit. And, and, and it, and it was also, dude, one of those movies, I always felt that it was the outgoing regime at Universal, kind of their hand grenade in the incoming regime. Cause it was like, it was working title. So I had, I had the imprimatur of like, you know, of Eric Fellner and Tim Bevan and, and that they're really kind of high end, very British, very, uh, very studied, very kind of wonderful, uh, film filmography uh, that they had put together, and and so they couldn't really say no. But the idea that you could do that movie now, Alex, that you could have the no main way. character, or, or not even the main character, the main character by default because everybody else is dead, unplug everything in this kind of nihilistic. And it's just funny. It's like the movie that I'm doing right now, Cop Shop. I say it's it's it, it's 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 absolute first cousin of Smoke and Aces, but it's not nihilistic. It actually has this great heart in its core. It's probably just me getting older and softer and, and, and not needing to kind of, you know, uh, do the, you know, so, so you would never make that film now in a traditional studio ever do. They would never let you get away with that. So I always thought that we got one over on everybody because it was such a, a downer ending, you know, Mm -hmm. more or less. It wasn't a, you know, it wasn't this uplifting kind of like the guy just fucking unplugs everything and sits there and, you know, disarms himself and throws his FBI credentials on the ground. That's that. It's like, and they let me, they let it go. Uh, it never happened now, dude. Ever. You know? Well, but, well smoking, is, smoking Aces would never get made today. Like, you just... You know what's crazy? Of all the movies I've made, the one that's been the bonanza in residuals is Smoking Aces. Hands down, dude. I've made more money after the fact on that movie than any other film. The A-Team, any of them. Like, that movie is so weirdly... Uh, uh, and I get friends of mine going, dude, every time that fucking thing's on, I watch it. And I have movies like that. Like, I don't care where Jaws is, where Heat is, where, you know, Road Warrior, where Aliens, I'm watching. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm in. Whatever it is, I'm in. Um, and, and Predator, it's like, I've got, oh, shit, man. Oh, they're going to, you know, they're going to, you know, they're going to kill uh, Billy, you know, you know, Sonny. It's like, he's dead. Like, I'm in there. So it, it, it's one of those, the kind of the repeatability and the playability, I think, is always something that, uh, that it I've is. done. And visually, I think Morrow really was edgy in the oh. way to shot that thing. And to this day, I look at it and go, man, that thing looks like it was shot last week. You know, and that's the great um, – that it has a timeless quality to it I love. You know, and the cut. It doesn't and feel dated at all. And the cut yeah. was insane. The cut right. was right. beautiful. Right, right. 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 So again, uh, uh, it's it was – it's it's just one of those movies, dude, that 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 <laughs> – and it was also misunderstood. Do same thing. It was like that movie was really for me about the war in Iraq. It was it was these, it was these, it was this kind of maniacal, insane levels of violence being leveled toward forces that we weren't quite, uh, you know, weapons of mass destruction. Who are we fighting? Wait a minute. Did these guys these guys weren't behind, you know, uh, uh, nine eleven. These guys were. Oh no, they weren't. We went in Afghanistan. So it was this nutty kind. Of, and then at the end, the government decided, well, we cut a better deal and fuck you. And that's really what it was about. And I just think it was like, oh, it's just fucking crazy. And it's, and it, but but, I'll, but it's again, there, I'll never forget. David Demby wrote the most awful review of the film, but it was so entertaining. I love the review. It was such if you're going to get trashed, get trashed by a really good writer. <laughs> get trashed by a really good critic. <laughs> Not like Willy Waffle. Get trashed by Anthony Lane or, you know what I mean, A.O. Scott. Or get trashed by a really good writer. But but it was and again, I just think to this day, dude, it's I, there's so many fans of that movie after the fact. Yeah. It's just around. And it's weird. It just plays, you know? Now, you've experienced – and I want everyone listening to hear it from you. Um, have you encountered any fake or scumbaggy kind of people in your filmmaking path, sir? Never, bro. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> like Doris Day – the pillows of fluff and goodness. What do you mean, dude? No, no. Oh, Jesus. I mean, I mean, dude, at one point in my life, I couldn't swing a dead cat while I hit a scumbag. It's like, you know, it's like you're just, it's, you know, Alex, but again, you can either let that dissuade you and you can become right. a cynic, a dick, which I've certainly had my moments. Um, or you could say, all right, this is a temporary, necessary evil, sometimes unnecessary evil, but you're, you're stuck anyway. 
Um, and, you know, listen, dude, I can't listen. This is the way that I've chosen to make movies, which is largely outside the studio system. Really, Smoke and Aces and the A-Team are the only studio films I've made, you know. Um, you know, Boss Level was, is, is, you know, it's become a Hulu film. A Cop Shop is STX, but that's still like, a, you know, we don't, it's still an indie film. It wasn't financed in a traditional, you know, kind of studio model. So, you know, you, you really can't. This is the this is the this is the path that I've chosen to go down. So I can't, you know, bitch and moan about. Uh, you know, oh no, of course. You know what I mean? But yeah, dude, there there are tons of, they're fucking they're knife fighters and and uh, and pimps and whores and uh, and uh, and you know they'll 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 slice you fucking, you know, appetite to to windpipe. It's like that's what they do. So you know, and they'll smile and they'll smile doing it and and they'll smile yeah. doing it. It's 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 and I and I again I always the whole point of what I do is to tell the reality of what the business is with hope. Like I, my my big my my mantra for filmmakers is like follow your dream, but don't be an idiot. Don't be an idiot. And, and by the way, dude, listen, you 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 know like the great. I don't know if you're aware of that great Katzenberg quote about you know in this town people live to see you fail, and if you die in the process, it's that much better. That's Hollywood. <laughs> what a That's the, great yeah, line. Dude. What yeah, a great line. yeah. In this town, people live to see you fail. And if you die in the process, it's that much better. There you go. What a great line. One of the, one of the great maverick kind of studio. You know what I mean? A guy. Yeah, yeah. A guy, dice, dude. A guy that's gone down swinging and, it has, and has had, you know, spectacular success. So and he's absolutely fucking lutely right. Yeah. You know, there's no, the no question. No, the that town is correct. Now, um, Another thing a lot of people don't understand that's such a reality, man, is rejection in Hollywood and rejection on your on your filmmaking path. And there is, again, illusions of people when they receive and directors when they re- get to a certain level that they just like you just – you know, Joe Carnahan could just walk into Universal and get whatever he wants made. Right. And I always tell people, dude, Spielberg couldn't get Lincoln financed. <laughs> Scorsese right. couldn't get silence financed for 20 yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah, the, dude, this is the struggle. I mean, listen, you say there's like, you know, there's like five guys, Jim Cameron, Spielberg, Chris Nolan, Michael Bay. I'm trying to get kind of, they're kind of like, okay, what do you want to do? But even then it's like, no, nah, we're not going to let you do that. You know, <laughs> yeah, no, 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 you can't do that. Well, no, just and, with Cameron. Cameron, they, they let uh, Cameron do whatever Cameron, yeah, Cameron, whatever. <laughs> Cameron wants to shoot interstellar space toilets. He can shoot, you know, it's it's about a fun guy that come, who they, they'll they give him the money to do that, right? <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, it's, right. But it's the truth. It's, I always tell people, like, listen, there's only one, there's literally one human being on the planet that could have made Avatar. There's, it's not, I'm not even, it's not like you can't, Nolan couldn't make that. Nobody else could make Avatar. You can't walk no. into a studio, ask, I'm going to need about $250 million to develop technology for an IP that's no, that's not existing. And we're going to figure it out. And, yeah. uh, and so that, you go, how are you shooting today? We're not shooting today. Get out of here. And they go, okay, well, we're not going to bother you. We're not here to bother you. Right. Oh, no thing. stars. And no and no major stars. Yeah, and no major stars. Right. Who, who does that? No one. No one. Jim Cameron. Jim Cameron, you know? It's like, but that's Jim Cameron, right? And also, like, you know, like, guys talk about Cameron. It's like, he's also the most unpretentious. It's like, yeah, he's got these things. He has, he has his way of working, and it's singular, and you've got to get on that thing. But at the same time, it's like, Hey, Jim, you hungry? Here's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Okay, great. You know, can I get a lift? Yeah, we just jump in the back of that truck. You know, okay, cool. He's not, you know what I mean? It doesn't, he's not precious. And I think that's what is, is, is the key to it is like, yeah, he takes that shit. It's, he's deadly serious about that. And I think, and I get that, man. It's like, I always tell people, it's like, hey, don't worry, guys. It's only forever. It's only forever. This fucking moment's only forever. Right. And by the way, they don't talk about, oh, that's okay. That's okay. People don't discuss in 50 years. That's okay is bullshit. We have this moment in time right now. Let's it's only forever, you know, and and that's it. Right. It's like, fuck, this is it, man. This is what they're going to see from now until the end of time. So goddamn, take a beat and do it right. And I think that's what Cameron is exceedingly brilliant at. Like, I'm going to do it this way. Listen, watch his watch aliens, dude. It's as good now as it was in 1986. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's as great now as it's as, as it's ever. It is a crackerjack sci fi war thriller. That's just dynamite. You know, and and he took everything that, that Ridley did and just weaponized it and just shot it with steroids. And 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 it's like, and it, you know what I mean? Every all the beats are there. He just made him expansive. But I, yeah, you're right. It's that guy, that guy, and that guy alone can get it done. No, you know? no, not Spielberg. Not, right. not you're right. N- nobody else on the planet. Right. And you can f- and 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 I think someone asked him that. Like, how does it feel to be like 
one of the only people in the world to be able to do something like that because there's like there's a hand there's like five guys like you just listed off a bunch of them that will get that kind of budget and again those kind of budgets are dependent on things but Cameron's right. it's not dependent on any I mean anything <laughs> it's, no, it's it's insane no, no it's not exactly it's just it's it's his it's what Jim wants to do you know and whatever whim that he's gonna follow that's amazing dude that's amazing. You know, but I would want that responsibility. I was like, man, because <laughs> five hundred million, <laughs> Cameron can't fuck off and go do a five million dollar film. So yeah, he can't. There's and there's and there's and there's a there's a different kind of freedom in that. He can't do that because expectations are too great. You know, I I I don't think I that is that that is not freedom. That's a, that's a set of expectations that you must meet. You know, it's like Chris Nolan go, go do Memento again. I I think that's a fucking genius film. It's a brilliant movie. Can he go do Memento again? You know, it's like, well, it's Chris Nolan. You know, it's like, right. So I, that, I, I worry that that's like, and I want to see him do that again. I want to see him do Memento or, or following. Those are great movies, you know, well, again, well, you know, no, I didn't mean, cut you off, but like I, that brings me to your film stretch because that's, that was exactly what that was because you've been, yeah. you've been playing in the, in the, in the semi studio and studio and like $20 million, 15, like you were at a higher level and then you're like, screw it. I want to make stretch for, I think you wanted three to five. I think it was like three to five, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was, I think it was just under $5 million movie. Yeah. Right. So it, it was, to me is one of the most talented guys I've ever worked with and mm -hmm. is a joy and funny as shit. And, and I adored it and I loved working on a film, but it was, and it was Jason Blum and it was one of those things. It's like, listen, and again, Jason's business model, you know, we're going to do, we're going to make 10 of these fuckers and maybe one of them punches through. But, and, and again, even that I was antagonistic about, you know, it was like, and, and, and because I thought, well, you know, we're gonna do, you know, we should do this. You should want to, do. that doesn't mean it's going to fit the studio calculus man with what they want to release and and so on so it doesn't matter i love that little movie and it's and it's just like and, it, and i and i had a blast making it i was making the blacklist at the same time so it's kind of like okay cool man i'll do the big you know kind of fuck off uh, uh tv pilot and, and series and i'm gonna go make this little indie you know because that piqued my interest and i thought it was you know i thought it was you know fun. i mean i literally alex messed around with like a, like a couple weeks ago i was like shit man i just i mean one just i mean shoot an entire film on an iphone and cut it on iMovie just to see if I could do it. You know what I mean? Like make a feature on an iPhone and not like, like Soderbergh made Unsane, but they had, they still had $50,000 Panasonic, you know, Pan, you know, Panavision lenses on those. You know what I mean? You still got like the G series. I mean, that's a fucking, that's a, that's a, that's a beautiful piece of glass, dude. So oh, it is, you know, it is. So but literally shoot it on an iPhone and say, okay, what can you do on an iPhone and iMovie? How good are you? You know what I mean? Or are you just full of shit? And literally say it's like it's like the dogma thing, you know, back in the day with with with, yeah, yeah. with, with uh, like Benjamin, all those guys it's like the dogma ninety five thing. It's like you can only use an iPhone, you can only use iMovie, you have to use all the effects and all the music that are contained within iMovie. And you gotta make a feature. That to me is exciting. That's fucking cool. Now I'll probably never do it. But <laughs> <laughs> you know, talk a lot of shit. I'll talk a lot of shit. But I don't I mean, look, know. look, I mean I, I, I did my my last feature I did for about three, four grand and it was shot on a pan a pocket camera, ten eighty P pocket camera, and I just ran a Sundance and shot an entire movie completely gorilla at Sundance. About filmmakers okay. trying to, about trying to three filmmakers trying to sell their movie at Sundance and the ridiculousness of what filmmakers are at, at their core, the egocentric, oh, the great. yeah, and that's what I did. I shot it in four days, and I came back. It was so much fun. Like I've worked on much bigger budget stuff, and yeah. I just like yeah. I was like, you know what? I want to see if I can do it, and I want to leave something behind as a call, like a, a love letter to filmmakers, and I just want to see that, and see and see what I could do. And dude, because it was so little budget, I was like. I, I don't know if I got a movie. Like we, we, we shot 36 hours. Like it was a 36 hours over four, right. for four days. And I, on the plane back, everyone was like, do you have something? I'm like, I don't know. I didn't have got time to just know. Got to get in there. Yeah, dude. And, and I just went in there. Fun, brother. That's fun. No, wait, so is much it fun. Done? Are you still messing with it? Is it done? Oh no, is dude, it? it's been released already. Yeah. It got, it got, it world premiered at rain dance and stuff. I'll send you a link. Oh, I'll send you a link. I see it, dude. What's it called? Bro? I want to see it. Where can I see it? Uh, on the corner of ego and desire. <laughs> Oh, that's great! What a great title! What a great title! Isn't so it yeah, I, you see these, you see these. But they, I'm like, guys, what in the fuck are you talking about? Do you know how lucky you are to be doing this goddamn line? Are you out of your fucking mind? I'm, like, I'm 
just get up and do it. Like my, like I, I always tell filmmakers, and I did it also as a, as a case study to show filmmakers. I'm like, I don't look. You don't need an Alexa. You don't need fifty thousand no. dollar glass. You don't need all this stuff. If you no. keep the budget super low, do whatever the hell you want. Now, if you would have given yeah. me two hundred fifty thousand dollars to make that movie, I would have probably said no because that story and that audience doesn't justify that budget. And I, unless it was money that I could throw away, so you have to be yeah. physically responsible. But at three right. or four grand, who gives a shit? Do whatever the hell you want, and people love it. And it's been like, and in, in, within my community, oh, people really. Dynamite, it's great. brother. It's, but that's, that's the, dynamite. But that that, that kind of goes to but your so point you of just. To go do it. I'm just gonna just go. go do, I'm just gonna go do by it. By the by the way, that was two months and about that, it was about six to eight weeks prior to Sundance. Like right. me and my me and wow. my buddy, just like, hey, we've got a million dollar suite that we're staying in on on Main Street. Shoot, let's go shoot a movie. All right, and then I just kind of like. Let's do this, 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 and this. That, it was I great, dude. Just, that. but that and that and that freedom. And I've talked to other filmmakers about it too, and they just like look at me. They're like, "Man, ah, what was that freedom like?" Like I had three crew members. I had the DP, right. I had the sound guy, I had myself, and I had um, the three actors who oh, I never well, met, who I never, out. who I never met. I only skyped them, and I casted them from New York and flew them. In, so I first met them. Oh. At, so it was completely, and it was it was it was kind of like a, a Kirby enthusiasm more improv like very structured story but the right. dialogue was improvised and i was just which is the mike lee ken loach you know kind of way of the yeah, the, yeah the kind, joe swansburg yeah. mark duplass yeah, yeah that whole yeah exactly dude exactly right that's i mean dude that's dynamite like that's, that's yeah and it's like and if you i guess if you get away from that stuff dude and you know you you stop being able to do that. i remember billy Freakin, who's a huge fan of uh, love Right, saying to me, man, Joe, I wish I could make a movie like that again. I wish I could just make a. I said, Billy, why can't you? Why can't you? And I understand what the because the expectations were. Well, it's William Friedkin, and it's got to be X. And and I think when you get, that's when you start to crawl up your own ass if you think you can't do that stuff. And that's why I always admire guys like Soderbergh who just says, "Fuck it, man. I'm just yes. gonna subvert this because I want to, and because it's fun to me and it's interesting, you know. And I'm gonna give you." any number of, of looks. And, and I don't really care how these things are quantified because every once in a while I'll remind you that how great I am by doing fucking oceans, like doing studio movies better than anybody knows how to do a studio movie and then fucking turn around doing magic mic and make it a mint off, you know, like, it's like, you know what I mean? So it's like, that to me is, is, is a real, is a, is a career worth really examining and studying. Oh, and, I love him. I love You know Sandberg, what I mean? He's dynamite. Uh, and he was the one, and he launched Sundance. He's the yes, one who's launched he did. He sex did. lies. The first thing he thought as a filmmaker do was was his sex lies and videotape, the compendium that had the screenplay and his kind of diary, and it was it was it was absolutely was compulsive. It was absolute must read for me to kind of get my head around, you know, what the indie film scene was like, and it was it was massively helpful. That stuff. It was. Yeah, it was. Dude, that's what you really learn. I think about yourself is like, I just did this whole thing. Like I literally took Lauren Green's song Ringo and put my two daughters. My at the time they were like five, and they they lip synced the whole song. And I did, it, and I had more fun doing that than I've fucking done. You know, literally, I had more fun doing that and got a bigger kick out of that than I have. Like, and it was just us messing around, you know. And well, and, and and that's what Rob, like Robert Rodriguez, uh, does that all the time with his kids in well, the dude, back. He, did, Robert's, yeah, he's, yeah, dude, yeah. He, Robert, Robert's, Robert's Robert, dude. But did you see? In that way. I'm assu- I'm assuming you've seen Mandalorian. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. Now back to the show. You know what, dude? I've watched. I haven't watched the second season of Mandalorian. It was okay. I was slow to get to it because I think I was kind of burned out on Star Wars for a minute. You God, know? All right. So the episode that Robert did, which is yeah. uh, which is a, it's I think episode five, was so it's so Robert first of all, but he later in the behind the scenes, he actually before he went to shoot it, he didn't have time to storyboard it, so he went in the backyard with stormtrooper figures and shot and 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 did a did a kind of a ripomatic of the scene he takes it to john favra and uh dave felonian and he goes yeah here's what i want to do and he's and dave just like halfway through he goes hold on can you stop for a second did you just go in your backyard and shoot this with like action figure star wars action figures <laughs> and he and robert's like yeah that's that's all i had i didn't have time to do it properly he's like that is the coolest thing i've ever seen in my life ever. and ever. It, it, it was by just way, dude, no pretense <laughs> robert's a filmmaker He's gonna he's gonna go out and do his thing, you know. It's like it's like he did it. I remember seeing he had done this. I mean, God, this is years ago now, 
with Rose McGowan. He had done yeah. – he had shown me a speech, but he'd shown me a sizzle reel. He just shot with her behind the scenes, the lady in the blue dress. It was a Sin City thing with her with blonde oh. hair and blue eyes in the rain. And it was like, whoa. And he said, yeah, just he shot it in an afternoon as a proof of concept. I'm like, dude, on his computer. You know, it's just <laughs> like he's got that. And then and then grabs a guitar and like and like you know crank out like the score. I mean it's fucking. <laughs> it's I'm, insane, I'm in awe, dude. You know, it's I'm insane, in awe. dude. It's just another <laughs> level of cool that I'm not capable of. You know, it's it's, um, it's absolutely insane, dude. Bananas. It's just bananas, dude. It really is, dude. So, dude, honestly, the gray your film, the gray, dude, is arguably I I, I just I think love 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 that film, and they marketed it so beautifully like oh yeah, wait dude. a minute Liam Neeson is gonna strap on some bottles and fight and fight a fucking wolf F- fight yeah. a fucking wolf that was and that was had- that was as low as high concept as you could get yeah 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 dude. and they didn't realize and it, was- it was like yeah and, and dude it was one of those things too it's like I remember we had like you know like a two hour and 25 minute you know uh, you know, mediation on life and death with occasional wolf attacks. It became an hour and 45 minute wolf attack with occasional mediations on life. And it was, you know what I mean? It was like, you know what I mean? It was like, it was like, you know, it's like, you know, you, you did, you, we changed the, 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 the polarity of that entire movie because right. we understood it's like you, this is what you need to give the audience. But that ending was always, it was never a sore spot for us. Like, listen, the guy's made a choice how he's going to die. And that's all you need to see. After that, it's superfluous. It doesn't, we don't need to see so the fight. Because we had a fight, dude. We had we cut a whole fight, and I was just was never a fan of it. And you see a little in one of the flashbacks, the wolf snapping in his face. That was from the fight, and we used that as kind of a nightmare to jar him out of the sleep. But it was like, it was more, and not because you know K and B, Nicotero and Howard Berger, those guys made the, these great kind of you know the snapping uh, puppet heads and the alpha and and and. But it was one of those. It's weird, dude, because I feel like I'll spend the rest of my career chasing what it felt like to make that movie. Which was wow. we were we were we were having this adventure and we just happened to be making a movie at the same time, you know. But we were up in like in Smithers, British Columbia, in the like in the in the deep deep snow. We got blown off the mountain twice. I was snow blind. I never. I mean, you know, like you you don't know what that's like, dude. Where your eyes just constantly buzz focus because you don't have any sense of foreground, yeah. mid background, background. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then I stayed out there out where we were in this cabin. And I'm telling you, dude, at six o'clock at night, it's pitch black. And it's it is a quiet like I, you will never experience in your life that that quiet, which wow. must sound like what 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 like what it would sound like when oh no one's coming for you you're dead out here. you know what I mean it was like thank God you know but like it was it was yeah it was it was a remarkable experience dude it was very much about you know where I was like people ask me it's like it's funny like you get asked about films and whatever and and my, I'm always at a loss because I go I don't really know that guy I knew that guy. I was that guy. I don't know what the fuck that guy was thinking. So I'm not really. I could give you. The, I could give you an approximation of what I what it was about to me. But I've heard theories about the film that are far more interesting and intriguing and smarter <laughs> than anything I've ever come up with. You know what I mean? So <laughs> you know, those are things you just let it go. It's like it's, it's out there. It's gonna it's gonna speak to different people in different ways, and you have to just allow that those translations to take place because you, who are you to say what the fuck it should mean? You know, I know what it means to me. I know what it's about. I mean. For me. I mean, you know, I, but, I mean, obviously, Die Hard is the greatest Christmas movie of all time. Now, that wasn't the intention, no, but no. <laughs> it has become that. Right. It has become that. And, and again, dude, it's you, you know, you're whatever those things are, whatever those, <laughs> you know, I've had people send me pictures where they tattoo the poem on their arm. I'm like, Jesus Christ, guys. Wow. I mean, you know, it's like, which is dynamite. But but it's a little, it's also, it's like, you know, it's like. It's a bit overkill, but I get it, man. I've had people say, listen, my dad was dying during that time, and that movie meant a lot to us. Oh, man. You know, it's like, wow, it's hard. It's amazing, dude. So, again, that's for it to do anything that that that, that approaches that kind of uh, – I'm so thrilled, dude, that, that it did that. And, and again, you can't – it's like a kid you sent off to college, and he winds up, you know, be, you know being successful, and, and you're kind of just in awe of it. But, but that's his – those all movies have their own existence. You release them and then they do their thing and then they grow and mature and, and, and take on qualities that you could have never foreseen. And that's always, that's such a lovely thing about this, about, about making films that, that they really um, evolve. You know, yeah. In, in I, I, kind of wonderful ways, you know, now you, um, you, 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 a lot of people don't know this, but you also write 
everything you do. Pretty so much, yeah. pr- pretty much you have a, a hand in everything you do. Yeah. Um, and you also just wrote like one of this year's big or last year's biggest movies, Bad Boys. Um, yeah. the, the new Bad When I saw anytime I see your name come up on, on a screen, dude, I'm like, oh, we're, oh, this is going to be fun. Like I just <laughs> like I always I'm always like when I saw the blacklist I'm like oh this okay I got okay Joe's doing right, right. this that's it it's gonna be fun you're, because you're in for a good time dude you're in for a good you're, time you're you're, you're good. this is gonna be fun I don't care what it is it's gonna be interesting it's gonna be fun let's let's rock right, and roll right, right, right. um and that's and that's the brand that you've you've cultivated over over the course of your career and for guys like me who kind of grew up at the you know similar similar vintages as far as age is concerned and seeing what you've done I'm like oh I that that's yeah okay that's Joe. So I get, I get what you're going to do. So what right. is, what is your writing process, dude? Cause you're prolific as a writer. I mean, you write a lot. Well, dude, I, I right now it's funny, man. You know, you're not, I'm not in the zone. I haven't been in the zone for a while because I haven't really been writing. And, and you know, so, but you know, it takes me, it, it takes me a day or two. Like I'll usually go somewhere and, and just get so I'm alone and I can focus and, and it'll, it'll be a day or so of me just tinkering around and dicking around until I start to get that thing moving. And then once it's moving, it's great. But it's like, you know, it's like, it's like juggernaut, the combo care. Once it starts going in one direction, you're just going to keep going. It's going to run through shit. And that's kind of how it is. Like you're just going to, you have to, I have to keep that momentum up. Um, but it's, but, but listen, sometimes, you know, I, I'll write a page in a day. Sometimes I write 10 pages. It just depends. It's really, but it's, but it's my, it's, it's the kind of the erstwhile, it's my most favorite thing to do therapeutically and creatively is to write still. Uh, because I just take great comfort in it because I can really, um, you know, and I've been doing it a long time, dude. And, it, 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 you know, after, after any, uh, hopefully, you know, you've been doing it for 30 years, you, you start to get good at it or you understand the kind of the, the ebbs and flows of structure and character and dialogue and so on. So it, it's a lot of, you know, uh, I don't do like vomit drafts. I don't just jam. I, I, I take my time and I write refined stuff and then I rewrite and then I refine and then I rewrite and refine find more. So I never just, you know, plow something out there for kind of general consumption. It's got to be kind of, I put a lot of fucking, you know, a lot of, a lot of heat on it, a lot of eyes Mm -hmm. on it, a lot of TLC. Cause I just think that's what, you know, but, but it it is, it it is a, it is a process to get into that mode Mm -hmm. of of thought. You know what I mean? Um, And you think, cause I'm editing right now, it's, it's kind of a, uh, the companion piece is writing. It's really not. It is a writing process. It's just not actual writing. So when you're asking me this now, if I was writing, I'd have a much more fluid. I, I wouldn't seem, I would seem a lot more confident, but right now I'm like, I don't know. What the fuck's going on. I don't know. If, I don't know if I'll ever write again. I don't know. I'm but not that's, sure, you know, dude, like when I'm writing, when I'm writing, like uh, when I write my books or things like that, I like you get down that road and you just start, you start writing and writing yeah. and writing and writing and yeah. writing. And then you stop and you just like, can I start this up again? Like it's, it's that, it's, it, it, it is a I moment. Have to, I have to stay in it. I have to really stay in it. Yeah. Uh, if I go more than two days, three days without writing, it's it's hard to get it's hard to get back in. And I'll find myself waking up at odd hours to get to go back and and keep moving. And again, sometimes these are little pyrrhic victories. Sometimes they're big kind of swaths of stuff that you cover. And um, but 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 it's it is in the best of scenarios. It is it is uh, not excruciating, but it can be. And there's scripts I've written, dude, that, that you know, like my, my script for Death Wish is still the best screenplay I've ever written. I think it's my best screenplay uh, because it was a total pain to kind of the ideas of, of of the way that the gray was about being, you know, this kind of macho bravado and who what we're expected to be as men and so on. So Death Wish is very much that. But it's like, you know, are, am I my core a coward? Am I would I if faced with these things? So I wrote this kind of pain to that pain and 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 this the, the emergent killer in this guy where you realize oh you're this you're a doctor but that's the fraud you're actually a killer that's who you are this other thing is you know you're 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 you know you're mr hyde masquerading as dr jekyll but you've always been mr hyde so it was this, and, and dude you know i had to like sit and watch that thing be essayed in a way that i did not agree with it was nothing like my screenplay right mm. but i took the show and so you shut the fuck up and i did you know, and not that I, you can't say, it's like, hey man, it doesn't matter what the hell I think of it. You know, it's like, it was not, it was, mine was very, very different, but it was one of those things where I pull it out, dude, now and then I go, boy, you ain't, you ain't that guy. You ain't that guy, you know, but dude, at the same time, I remember writing it on scotch and probably cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, eh, I think I remember doing a little bit of blow, but like, 
but it was, it, <laughs> but that fuel is false. And, and again, you, I, I've learned that now because I'm basically kind of sober at this point in my life. And, yeah. and I feel more energized and more capable and more willing. So I don't think that these are things that can just be accessed. And I think, again, we all have that romantic kind of, you know, Hemingway and Steinbeck and Peck and Paul and all these guys who got hard drinkers and Bukowski. And, no, no. Yeah, you know, they died young and they died horribly, you know, so. <laughs> right. so yeah, they didn't, die, they didn't die quietly in their sleep surrounded you know, by loved ones. You know, the roast delivered uh, Hemingway bolt barrels of, a, of an over-under shock. You know, so like, yeah, he, you know, they went out, uh, you know, they went out in a very, very grandiose fashion. So you, you romanticize that and I realize it's not really where it is. So now, and I also think dude, there's a, there's a reticence on my part to jump back into something original because i know there's there's a, for me there's a there's the high watermark can we get back there and be that because I, I still write for people that read i don't write bullshit scene breaks i write you know um and that's what death wish was you know the first 25 pages are a standard screenplay the minute that guy gets attacked the entire thing shifts to first person so there's no more scene breaks so i wrote i'll write entire pages just asterisks because he's knocked out and then it goes in a large, large font, and then it, and then, nice. it, and then half the page is empty. And then you know what I mean? Like I was doing, it was kind of like art to me, you know. Nice. And I thought, God damn, like I don't know if I ever get back to that, you know. And that's kind of the, that's what's exciting to me. It's like fuck, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta figure out a way to top that. I gotta figure out a way to to get, you know, write something that's I think is better, you know what I mean? And that's, you know what I mean? That and that's kind of a, it's a great dude. It's a great, um, that's a great, uh, uh expression of energy you know absolutely you know now there was there was one script of yours that was fairly famous that didn't get made i know it's something that you always wanted to make uh killing pablo um yes which was a script but i heard that someone literally because screenwriters are always scared of people taking stealing their work and doing something with it you from what i understand someone literally took the cover off of the script Oh, put their name on. I'll tell you who his fucking name is. Yeah, this guy, this guy, this guy literally was the fun. He went and got wined and dined by the Colombian government because I've been down there a couple of times. And he literally just tore the cover page off and said, written by Bob Yari. And that was the, that was the, the, that I saw the screenplay. I got, I, so there it was. And I thought, wow. And again, we go back to, you know, the treachery you experience in this business. It's like, I don't know where the guy is now. He might be, who knows what he's doing. He's probably maybe selling snow cones. I don't know what the hell he's doing. But, mm-hmm. you know, it was, you know, what would have shocked and awed me back then and, and would just disgust and contempt is like, yeah, you know, he, he made a run at him, man. He tried to, he tried to sell an angle. He tried to, but yeah, was basically using that to kind of, uh, you know, get, get his way with the Colombian government, which is just insane to me. Dude. But not the smartest, but, not the smartest thing to do. No, no <laughs> not yet. No, not when you can track it. And by the way, the script, the, the script had been around for a little bit and it had gotten, it had gotten a lot of good, uh, uh, attention. And so, you know, but, but then, you know, then, you know, Jose Padilla and, and Wagner Moore, and they did, you know, they do that great, you know, thing with, uh, with, uh, with narcos. And it's like, I couldn't, it couldn't have been a better team to tell that story. So I wasn't, I was bummed out, but mm-hmm. my, my screenplay was really Bowden's book. It was really the manhunt for Escobar. Not so much. And I think that's the problem I had finding someone to want to play Escobar because Javier Bardem was going to do it for a while. And, I think they wanted they wanted that Robin Hood like romantic angle of Pablo and, and he was a fucking absolute bloodless killer. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I love this family. We all do. You know, you could be a homicidal maniac and still love your kids. And and that's what he was. And I think I was more interested in that in the in the run up and how insane he almost tipped over a, a democracy at the time. Uh, Sixty two million people in Colombia. It's like this guy almost almost ran the table, you know, and, and that mm-hmm. was fascinating to me. And it was because of some very brave people, uh, Colombian uh, officials that stood against that shit. Not unlike what we just experienced in, in a very different way that, that basically mm-hmm. stemmed the tide of uh, that becoming a narco state, you know. Um, but yeah, man, it was, and it was, you know, again, one of those screenplays is like, ah, God damn it, you know. <laughs> it happens. But we there's always, always, we always have that story or that film or that thing that we couldn't, couldn't get made um and and it's it's not even the lack and that's the thing i want people to understand it's not the lack of quality it's not the lack that if it's a good script or if it's a marketable script sometimes the stars just don't align they don't align you know i've had it happen dude i had listen 
White Jazz, which is a sequel to L.A. Confidential. You know, my brother and I wrote the absolute shit out of that script. And, and I've been and I, we, we were we were dude, literally like a year ago on the one inch line with Netflix. Right. To go do that. Oh. And it just didn't, you know, it just didn't happen. And I remember there was like the British version of Tosh and Books reached out to me and said, do you mind sending us your materials on White Jazz? We want to include it in a in a in a compendium called the, the 20 Greatest Movies You'll Never See. I'm like, you go fuck yourselves. One, no, I'm not sending you. Wait, wait, wait. wait. I was supposed to be honored or flattered? Oh, wow, you like it that much? You want to include it in your book of movies you'll never fucking get made? No. How about no? How about fuck off? <laughs> Jesus, man. Can you imagine if they called Kubrick up? I'm like, can you send me your notes on Napoleon? On Napoleon? Yeah. It's like, how about no? Ever. <laughs> fuck you. You know? <laughs> Live to fight another day, dude. You live to fight another day. You know. So, dude. So the so boss level, dude. Yes. It, it's it's insane, dude. Like the trailer looks insane. It's yeah. basically so. Basically, this is what I this is my analogy of it. It's Groundhog's Day, which of course was just the yeah. first kind of like time loop right. film I that I can remember. Yeah. Groundhog's Day meets Smoking Aces. <laughs> yeah, Die Hard. It's Die Hard. And Groundhog's Day. It is. Yeah. It's yeah. It is. It really is. It's like. It's it's uh, it's just again, dude. It's just one of those movies that everything it's it tried to do, or we tried to do, and it just worked. And uh, it's funny as shit. Um, there's complete kind of uh, there's this young actress Selena Lowe who who plays Guan Yin. Yeah, uh, this, Sorry, this trailer just absolutely steals the movie. And then you've got Frank Grillo in this in this kind of really so good. I, you know I, I do we watch I said dude watch it's funny we watch like we watch Singing in the Rings so I watch Gene Kelly watch the way he moves watch Harrison Ford watch how Harrison Ford watch his relationship with the camera man watch how he understands uh, where he's and 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 you're you're setting about making this very uh, uh, deliberate kind of big Hollywood kind of spectacle action movie comedy. That's just absolutely fucking bonkers that they never would have let me do this stuff, dude, because it's nuts. But it's but it, when I tell you, dude, it's one of the funniest. It's just laugh out loud funny. It just works. And uh, and we're and, and again, I'm incredibly fortunate that it found because it's been, you know, two years of, of, of struggle and hardship and so on uh, to get it out finally. And, and, and God bless the powers of be at Hulu. They saw it and responded to it the way that we wanted them to. And so. Yeah, man, it's 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 nuts. It's but when's, it, and when's my, it come out? And when's it come out? March fifth on Hulu, which I think is I don't know what day that is, but that's I can't yeah. wait, dude. I it's so it's so dude, so good. It's so much fun. It really is. It, it's really and like I said, it's emblematic of me and my personality. It's just oh, it's, it, it no, it's, it's no quite scatological. Then it gets serious. Then it goes back to being you know kind of it's 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 great. And he's great at it, you know. Uh, now he really is. You know, now, Mel's great. Uh, Naomi's great. No. Yeah, Mel, Mel. I mean, Mel's Mel, dude, and I and I'm looking forward to sure. seeing. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing Lethal Weapon f- f- five, five, yes, me five. Too. Yeah, <laughs> I want to see me what too. they no. do with those me two. Too. <laughs> I know, I know. And Donner's I, I doing Mel, it, and Donner's doing no, it. Donner's doing it. He said, "I guess Mel. I guess the script is actually really good." I, I love that Dick Donner's doing ninety. That, yeah, I was going to say, how old is he? Like, that's like how old is he? Old. He's the, 89, yeah, 89, 90 years old. But by the way, Clint's oh. still doing it. Clint's ninety, so. But you know, Clint, I mean, that's how I, Alex, that's how I want to go out. Just wheel. I don't care if I'm in a fucking wheelbarrow. If I'm just a head and like a, a small intestine, just wheel me around. Let me say cut in action. Well, it's like, and I'll be it's like Hitchcock. It's like Hitchcock was literally being rolled around on a wheelchair. He might get rolled around when he's like 40. I mean, that's, you know, it's not, you know, it's to be like, fair, yeah, but you, you know, to be fair. Yeah. I, <laughs> right. But, but yeah, dude, I, I, you know, it's like, you know, I think it was like reading an article years and years and years ago when, uh, when, uh, uh, David Lee was trying to make Nostromo and he couldn't get insured because he was too old. It always broke my heart. I'm like, <sighs> fucking David, you can't figure out how to put David Lean on set, you know, or, or like when Altman had to basically have P.T. Anderson, like kind of, yeah. kind of understudy him on, on, I forget the movie, but, but uh, those stories are always kind of like, I, I just want to be vibrant enough and still mentally acute and cogent enough that I can, that I can understand what the and physical going. and, and physical. If I'm not, even if I'm not, just don't take my mind. Just don't strip me of my, you know, you know what I mean? Like, don't have me start talking to my, to like, like my, my boogers, please. Like, I don't want to do that. Have deep discussions with. You know what I mean? Please just spare me that, you know? Now, I'm going to ask you a few questions I ask all my guests, bro. Um, what is the one thing you wish you could tell your younger self? Oh, God. I think I went into it, dude. But I would just say to him, hey, dude, pace yourself. Don't talk so much. 
Uh, you don't have to entertain everybody. Sometimes silence is golden. Um, <laughs> and not everybody needs to know your opinion at every moment. And, and, and just uh, know enough to know when you don't need to do anything. Just let it be, you know, and, and chill. Patience, my son. Patience. That's what I would tell people. So, what, what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Um, you got to outwork everybody, man. You really, hey, do. man. You hey, be man. You know, man. listen. It's like you know, like they used to talk about, like VJ Singh as a golfer. You go out and hit a thousand balls, and everybody else to hit a hundred. You should be hitting a thousand balls. You should be out there, you know, perfecting and honing your craft, and getting better and better and better, and learning all the tricks of the trade. And in, in addition to learning those, learn the shortcuts. Learn the, the areas you can save yourself time. You know, like you're saying, but and, and and understand everybody's job. Know what the know what the know what a colorist does. Know what the you know know what uh you know the the, what the sound mixer does. Know what the, the the production designer does. Know what the sound designer does. Know know these various jobs. Know the DP. Know lenses. Not that you have to know these things and you know in, encyclopedic uh, kind of uh, uh, fervor like Kubrick or Spielberg that know those things like the specific like ground glass how that thing is gonna. That's a whole other level of freakish genius. But get yourself educated <laughs> and 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 uh, and don't take a goddamn thing for granted because you can't take anything for granted. Not oh, now. man. Uh, maybe not ever, but certainly not now. There's a lot of competition out there and it's stiff. And I wouldn't want to be coming up right now when you're trying to like bust through uh, when you got guys like Damien Chazelle doing what he's doing, which I think is wunderkind like. And, and, you know, so it's a tough it's a tough uh, road to hoe for sure. Yeah, it's it, it the 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 world's changing so effing rapidly, man. It's just like so ridiculous. Our business has changed so dramatically in the last Sorry, year. Dude. Yeah, man. But like, it's like literally. Like, anyway, like you said, you you said in that prior pocket, like we we may never recover, and it's certainly not going to look the way it's looked uh, in the past. And I think that's. And you know what, Alex? That's all right, dude. That's okay. Like, yeah, but, uh, but it didn't. Know, but it didn't look. But it didn't look the same way since, uh, like, when VHS showed up and DVD showed up and then streaming showed up. Like, it always color showed up, sound showed up. Like, it's always yeah. there's. It's, there's it's always just changing. Evolution. Just there's just it's just happening so much faster now. I mean, bro, listen. I got one of those Oculus Quest. Put that on and play Beat Saber and tell me that you're not gonna have to fuck with <laughs> VR at some point. Play Super Hot. <laughs> And tell me you're not going to fuck with VR. How do you compete? How do you how do you how do you compete with that? It's a four hundred dollar unit. It's cooler than any video game I've ever owned in my life. You know, like, are you kidding me? It's like so so. You know, you're gonna we, you have to do these things, and you can't get mired in tradition. You can't get mired in well. It's got to be this way. I got to make a studio film. Listen, when I was young, if you had a two picture deal in Universal, you were you were hot shit. That's indentured servitude, basically. You're just giving your ideas to you're just giving your IP away. To, you know, it's like don't do that. Or if you're gonna do it, do it the way Todd Phillips does it. And that guy, it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me make it for you know. Let me make my little fee, and then I'm gonna take a gigantic piece of your bag in success. And that's and there, that's a guy playing a game at a very very high level. You know, so there are ways. There's certainly ways to game the system. And even with Chris Nolan, like listen, whatever your feelings about Tenet, right? You liked it, you didn't like it, whatever. The fact that guy's still taking those kind of swings at the plate to try to put the ball fucking 500 feet from home plate, you got to have those guys, man. That's exciting to me. So there's all these areas uh, of progress and of evolution. And mm -hmm. it's like you you got to find them. you got to make them your own. And you got to extend your own game, whatever that may be. And uh, the hardest question of all, three of your favorite films of all time. That's not that difficult, dude. Raging Bull. Raging um, Bull? Raging Bull. Raiders of the Lost Ark. And there's a film called Harakiri from Masaki Kobayashi from 1963, Seppuka, that's basically, I think, is the best samurai film. And I and, and may, may, may uh, Kurosawa strike me dead from beyond. But, like, uh, it's one of those movies that just I just adored it. And I just saw it. I just showed it to my DP in Atlanta. We had, like, a – we put, like, a big – like, a home theater in the basement of this place so we could watch movies. And it's just one of those epically brilliant slow burns that you just don't see anymore. I love that film. Dude, it has been an absolute pleasure talking oh, to you, man. Uh -huh. Like I could talk, we could talk, we could talk for another like, again, two or three hours. <laughs> yeah, we could do anytime you want to come back. You're always I'm welcome. Gonna, to you know, if, if I got a DUI or I'm in trouble, bro, I got to come on. You know, you got to make, make a little room for me, bro. You know, yeah, no, absolutely. Myself in a trouble. <laughs> my goal, my goal is now to get you to go out and make a five or ten thousand dollar film. Like that, that's. The, I do. I'm telling you right now, we got to talk offline, bro. I don't think this. <laughs> I don't think that's a bad idea. I don't, and I think there's some. There's some. I think it's ballsier to go do that than it is to go out and solicit, like, let me go make a $10 million film. You know, what can you do with nothing? 
you know? Right. And, and in today's world, like when you and I were coming up, man, like it was expensive as hell to do anything. Like you shot on yeah. film, like that yeah. seven grand was Bro, film stock. 12 has got a better camera than any, video, than any film or video camera we've ever used in our lives and can Absolutely. approximate, what is it? An 8K, whatever the fuck. It's, like, it's insane. That is insane, dude. It, that is lossless. Like you could like – we had to go like, oh, shit, you got to go beta cam, beta SP to beta – oh, there's a generational loss. In. You had to deal with that shit. Three-quarter inch, one inch, three-quarter inch. Get, just to get the film flicker. I can do that on a fucking – on a filter. You know, color t- – give me a break, dude. You know, it's, it's like this is the kind of shit that's at, that's at your fingertips. So it's like I tell you something. Stop dicking around on, on Twitter and, and face like, – go and, and, and examine – and explore these things because they're amazing, you know. And you can really do some, you can really do great shit for no money. The key isn't the 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 the, 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 the what you call the barrier of entry is not the tech anymore and the cost no. of the tech. It no. is the how to make money with it, how to get no. it seen. Not only that, but it's also the creative gumption and ambition that you there's that to mm-hmm. get it. Because you know what, you may not make a fucking dime, and you've got to come to grips with that. You've got to say, okay, that's the possibility. How bad do you want it? That question remains. That question persists. Brother, it has been a pleasure. Keep doing what you're doing. And I appreciate I I appreciate you, man. Thank you so much, brother. I want to thank Joe for coming on the show and dropping his bullet-ridden knowledge bombs on the tribe today. Thank you so much, Joe. If you want to check out his new film, Boss Level, it's going to be available. March 5th, exclusively on Hulu. Now, if you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 443. And guys, if you haven't already, head over to IFHAcademy.com and check out the amazing new courses we have on the platform, including James V. Hart's Screenwriting Masterclass, the Film Distribution Blueprint by yours truly, and many, many more. Again, that's ifhacademy.com. Thank you so much for listening, guys. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. Stay safe out there, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 